Hi, everybody, and welcome to the SAP Press Book Club event. And um, so I see everybody is coming in. So let everybody kind of get in. We have a big audience today. Um, gosh, I think it was over 2,000, like 2,500 people have signed up for this. And I was just looking at where all you guys are from. And it is literally international. I was looking at some of the countries. I was like, I didn't even know that they had SAP there. So um, we have a great book to uh, talk about today. And so it is, let me get the book, um, SAP S4 HANA Architecture. And if you don't know who I am, I'm Kendall Tyler, and I'm the host of the SAP Press Book Club event. And um, so the guys we have today are all in Germany. So I think that's really cool. Um, they're all working at SAP as well. And they wrote the book along with how many guys was it besides you guys was like 16 or some other guys, but we have the main people here with us, which is great. And I'll love to introduce them. Um, so let's start with, um, let me get the names right, Tobias Stein. Um, he comes to us from almost 25 years at SAP. And he is the senior executive head of the SAP S4 HANA uh, business suite architecture. So, Tobias, say hey to everybody. Yeah, thank you, Campbell, um, and welcome. Thank you for, for having me and the invitation to this session. Thank you for the opportunity to get in touch with all of you and to be able to, to answer a couple of questions. Uh, as you said, Tobias Stein is my name, almost 25 years with SAP, Senior Vice President Head of uh, SAP S4 HANA Architecture, which is actually a unit of the most uh, experienced and most senior architects in our ERP development organization uh, within uh, SAP. I'm personally a developer at heart. I spent most of my career in development roles uh, as a developer, as an architect, senior chief architect, yeah, responsible for various products within SAP, among ERP, also in the supply chain area. And yeah, I'm uh, passionate about software engineering uh, and ERP, of course, and especially also cloud architectures. So, Gosh, you've been there a long time. Now, what was your first role at SAP? Do you remember? Yeah, I was a, a Java developer working <laughs> on uh, on Java test tools within SAP, but uh, only for a year. And then I went uh, to um, core ABAP development in ERP. So actually I was working on R3 for five uh, back then in the logistics area. Mm. Quite a long time. Let's see if our next our next guest, <laughs> uh, let me do it right, Johan Broder. Is that do it? Yes. <laughs> I'm getting so German. Um, he is uh, SAP. He's been working at SAP for 21 years, and he is the senior development manager over the SAP architects and developers in the central SAP S4 HANA unit. So I am pretty sure that. Johan reports to Tobias as well. So, Johan, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes, um, you're right about <laughs> how we work together. And I think um, one, I, I also got that book here, right? So, I think that is um, great. And I think um, <laughs> I'm passionate about the technology, the architecture on the one hand, but also about communication. And I think that, that is also part of an architect's shop. Um, and doing that in a written form, like we did it now with the book, is certainly special and, and is an additional effort there. Yeah? But um, apart from that, I think it's also a lot about how we collaborate, uh, especially as a central architecture team within this um, our product engineering unit for the S4HANA product, yeah? which is the core product of SAP. Um, and we, are, we work together with all the different uh, line of business units, which produce the code and the functionality and features 
which at the end make the product which we documented. Yeah, and I think you mentioned the sixty-three authors um, that were also experts how many? across the Wait a minute, how many? at the end sixty-three. <laughs> so a lot of people in this. Yeah. Well, it's a lot of information to be honest with you, and it's very you know I mean this is not like well I guess I want to say like rock scientists, but kind of is when you get down to it. Um, but yeah, there's um. A lot of you guys, and I'm so proud that all of y'all got together and did this because it's a great book. And our next guest is, all right, let's see if I can do this. Wolfram Kleis. Right. <laughs> You're right. I did it right? <laughs> yeah, perfect. <laughs> yeah, so. so he comes to us again from SAP, and he is 23 years at SAP. And you are one of the senior architects on the team, right? Right. So, so tell us about yourself. 23 years, a long time. Yeah, we're from Gleis. So I, I uh, yeah, joined SAP in 1999 and as a developer. And I think I started in area CRM mobile technology, but mobile meant a laptop, a notebook <laughs> computer. That's hot. a long time ago, right? And yeah. then, uh, yeah. Uh, I worked in various positions in technology in Java infrastructure and uh, also project management, product management, development, and also architecture. And yeah, one of my passions is documenting architecture, explaining architecture, like understanding complex architectures, explaining it to others in a way that it's easy and really understandable. And um, so this book was was great uh, opportunity for me to to apply that and, and to do that, yeah. And uh, so I worked in different areas, including uh, Internet of Things, for example. And then 2020, when uh, I I joined this architecture team, and uh, this book was one of my 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 first bigger projects, and uh, it was great because with these 60 authors, it was being new in that. Uh, in, in that team, it was a great opportunity to learn all the key developers and architects, uh, get to know them, and to have the um, yeah um, build this network. But it was a great opportunity, and working together with all these experts, it was really fun. Well, you know, to be honest with you, you guys have all been at SAP for so long. You've seen from the beginning to where it is now, and being involved in that journey is you know amazing because. You think about it, wow, all these companies are, you know, doing what y'all thought you know, <laughs> and put together and, you know, kind of, you know, started the whole, you know, understanding of getting everybody on SAP and S4HANA and what exactly, I mean, architecture is very complex and involved. So definitely a team organizational group y'all had here. And um, so let's... Um, I love to uh, ask the obvious. And um, so let's do the first obvious question. Um, so when you say architect architecture, what is the scope of this book? I mean, architecture is huge. It's you know overwhelming. You, you could take it from all over the place, but where how do you how did you break this book down to where you know, I'm a CIO, I'm um, functional, I'm technical, I'm a developer, I'm a student, you know, um, or I'm a user. How did you kind of like think all of those different roles into what exactly you're offering for them? I think from the, maybe we come from the, the term, yeah, architecture and the definition. I think it's like if you construct a, a building yeah? as also in software architectures about the components yeah? the relationship of the components also the external visible properties i think that's the, the most prominent common definition um but that can be have different perspectives yeah and what we're not talking about in the book is basically this the, the enterprise architecture perspective so how to really use the s4hana product within a, a companies or organizations um, software landscape um, what we were really looking at was from an engineering perspective. Yeah, if you build s hana what are the, the big components? Um, and there we have also different aspects to look at. And I think that's why the book has three parts. 
Now we had the technical foundation, we have the application architecture, and we have um, cloud and operations architecture. And technical foundations is, is really the frameworks, um, the technology you build the applications on. And the application architecture, I think that's a little specific of the book, is really what are the main objects, uh, what are frameworks in order to for this specific um, business domain, yeah, in, in order yeah. to make that work. And I think that's um, hardly documented or, or described somewhere, I believe. I know, because, you know, a lot of people think that it's all industry specific things, but with the, within what you're doing, it goes everywhere. I mean, it's cross boundaries, cross industries. I mean, it's not just, you know, for one particular industry, you guys are hitting them all. <laughs> Exactly. And uh, yeah, as, as Jochen said, it's it's not only on-premise, it's on-premise and, and public cloud that we are covering in the book. And there uh, a question might come up, um, yeah, if, uh, if it's really relevant for all of you to uh, get a deep technical understanding of a software as a service product, yeah, because in the end, uh, you want to consume a, a service uh, for, for cloud ERP, why do you even have to bother with all these uh, technical details? Huh? Um, and I, I would say, yes, that's uh, absolutely right. Huh? That's uh, totally the case, but there is a but. Yeah? And, and, and what we found out with a lot of uh, discussions with, with customers and, and partners is that it tremendously helps to have a uh, basic understanding of how uh, the solution works yeah, in order to, um, in the end, uh, yeah, um, take the right decisions and to use uh, and set up the system in an e efficient and effective way. Yeah? For example, uh, we will talk later on probably about the virtual data model, which is the, the heart of the application architecture. Yeah? You, you do not get so much into contact uh, with the VDM as a normal business user, yeah. But but if you know how uh, this is actually architected, um, this will tremendously help you to get the most out of uh, the system and the best out of the system. Because then you understand uh, how you can relate data, how you can use data in uh, the best possible way. Yeah, and in the end, to create the best possible enterprise architecture for your customer scenario uh, or even if you're a partner as well i think it's kind of like having a car you know for me it's like yeah i want a really cool car but do i want to look under the hood and see exactly how it runs and you know i put gas in but i don't know how it all kind of goes together but it works i mean i think that's you know the, the whole model but i'd like to know i mean yeah <laughs> Curious. I would like What's to add one on? aspect, uh, like uh, so, when it, especially when it comes to application architecture, right? We don't go into the details. We we want to to show how the things fit together on conceptual level, and each of the application areas you could write several books about it, and there are books about them, like like uh, as for Hana Sales, for example, you could have, you could have several books about that. Um, our book may may help you to to get an initial idea of what role this sales plays in the, in the big picture and and it may be a good start and then if you want to dig deeper you can go to all the other resources we have like application documentation other books I don't know video resources whatever no, but but this would, would be a good start to get the the overview right. Mm. And that's I think like like you said with the car yeah I think it's it doesn't help you at the end to repair the car. But it helps you to understand and enjoy um, while you're driving because you know a little bit the background, yeah. You know which kind of engine you have, why this is a great engine, um, these kind of things. Oh yeah, definitely. And by the way, everybody, I just wanted y'all to know that this is a rare treat um, to have these three guys. I was asking them earlier. I was like, so do y'all do a lot of like you know talking to you know like people and doing a lot of this? And they were like. <laughs> so I was, I was like, this is great. I'm getting the guys out of SAP who everybody wants to talk to, but we never get to talk to. So I think it's wonderful. I just wanted to thank you all, um, you three for doing that for us, because this is great. And, you know, I, everybody wants to know, like, you know, how does it work? What's going on? And, and I think the biggest thing for every, the biggest excitement I've seen in the SAP community is, is, Esperhana. And I mean, 
getting to that next level, the integration and everything. And so like what what are need what are the needed characteristics that are the architectural challenges of a modern ERP system? Hmm. So we've been talking about like, you know, ECC, Sforhana, what what are the, you know, what are the characteristics of what the architectural challenges are? Yeah, great, great question. Maybe I give it a start. Um, but I think we haven't even introduced S for HANA yet. Maybe I That's also true. spend two or three sentences on what S for HANA is, because I assume most of uh, the um, people in the audience will be aware. But uh, That's that's true. Uh, let's talk about, all right, let's go backwards. Let's talk about S4. What yeah. is, all right, we all know ECC, cool product, all on it, been there for a really long time. But um, S4, how did it start, happen? What was the whole, you know, concept behind it? Yeah, so, so definitely um, S4 HANA is SAP's uh, flagship ERP product, uh, as mentioned, on-premise, private cloud, and, and public cloud. It's uh, clearly the most important product product that SAP has in, in the portfolio. And you can also tell from uh, the, yeah, the adoption number of customers that we have more than, than 20,000 customers are actually using it uh, most of the um, yeah, Fortune 2000 uh, companies, uh, the Forbes Global 2000 companies are, are using it. And it, it's actually, uh, in, in terms of uh, functional depth, I would say it's, uh, yeah, um, yeah, the, the most, um, yeah, comprehensive ERP solution on the market. Uh, oh, so yeah. The, the, the digital digital core of S4 HANA is uh, larger and is it's more complete than all the, the competitive solutions that we have. If you think of what we have in finance, logistics, sales, procurement, manufacturing, supply chain, and all the, the business processes. And customers are running their mission critical business processes uh, on uh, S4, which is always a, a guiding uh, principle for us to look uh, in in that direction because uh, we know that uh, customers uh, are relying their businesses on our software product which uh, also is a good segue to the characteristics uh, of yeah. our um, architecture in the end because this is one of the most uh, fundamental uh, principles that we have we need to be able to provide a solution for uh, the mission critical business processes of our customers. Yeah, and, and also I'm not sure if everybody in the call is aware of uh, how large S4 HANA actually is. So it consists of uh, more than 200 million lines of code. Um, so we have done uh, yeah, investigations and we actually haven't found a more sophisticated or larger software product that was uh, built. Um, so it's larger than uh, most of the operating system kernels or everything that that uh, the the NASA has, for example. So it's it's re really uh, the, a huge uh, software system. It's uh, yeah available for. Uh, all 25 industries uh, that our customers are op operating in. It's localized for more than 180 countries. So it's not that large because it's just uh, so complex. Yeah, it's so um, large as a system because because it's covering all of the business process variants all across the globe that our customers are, are having. Um, yeah, and it's uh, but still flexible and modular as a system um, can be used as a platform, um, especially when it comes to, to ex extensibility. We always uh, um, yeah think of uh, flexibility and extensibility in ERP as using a platform because this, this is what our customers actually want to do. They want to take our business processes and process and, and steps and create uh, and adapt it to their uh, yeah, customized business processes. And this is what S4HANA is actually used for. 
Yeah, and having said That's that, maybe, yeah. let's now talk about the characteristics, maybe. I'm not sure you know <laughs> yeah, you're because, about. you know, I was thinking about the whole S4 HANA. If you think about it, you know, yeah. HANA was great. Everybody's like, yeah, jump on HANA. You know? <laughs> it's fast. It's cool. But then when you guys got to S4, you really changed the game. You brought in a totally different product. I mean, if you look at all the business processes, and the cool thing was that because you guys were so large, you were able to gather this information from all these different industries that you, you know, were supporting and so forth. So it's a great product and I love the, you know, opening it up and letting other, you know, other um, pieces of software integrate because that's what people want. That's how you become competitive. And so um, one thing that I thought was really cool that was mentioned in here was about um, environmental and social responsibility. Did you see that part in the book? They were talking about that um, even though you can't solve the world's environmental problems, you can at least be involved to the end of the end to end production and logistics manner across the supply chain to get those products out that need to be done. That was, that's pretty cool. But um, yes, yeah, so let's talk about um, let's talk about the sustainability within. The um, so backwards back to the first question the architectural challenges. What are what are the architectural challenges of a modern ERP solution? I know one is performance, we were just talking about it, you know, how robust scalability. Can I or please? Yeah, I think you mentioned um, HANA already. Yeah, I think that is yeah. maybe the, the trigger point. Um, HANA was a starting. Yeah, and and one expectation is certainly performance and scalability. Um, HANA with its in memory capabilities was enabling us um, to have the yeah the also the data one time for analytical and for transactional use cases. And I think that is. Um, a characteristic and and also a part of the solution already yeah um, maybe i would like to to add um first of all we, we should answer the question why was it even relevant or why was it needed uh, in the first place to to change uh, the architecture or to to adapt uh, the the software architecture for a digital era cloud erp or on premise erp program mm -hmm. yeah? and i think uh, there we just have to look at the market, what it actually has changed in the business and in the environment. And Jochen is absolutely right with uh, um, yeah, performance, robustness, and scalability. But the question is, why is it now more important than uh, 10 years or five years ago? And the reason is that uh, just the data volumes of customers are exponentially growing because we have so many new um yeah, data sources like, let's say, sentiment data, sensor data, mm -hmm. spatial data, market feeds, experience data, all of that is going into the ERP context. Yeah? Um, and uh, in S4HANA, we have to, to cope with that. Yeah? And, and, and therefore, uh, we, have, uh, we had to come up with a um, yeah, cloud ERP architecture that is actually capable of... Um, yeah, of, of operating that, yeah, and uh, besides um, this kind of change in the digital era, there are numerous more, like, for example, uh, the way how uh, business users and customers want to interact with the system is now, yes. nowadays, completely different compared to what we had 10 years ago, you know, you want to have it modern, you want to have it on any device, you uh, so I, I would say the, the um, situation that a business user is actually using a, um, yeah, a, a client-based uh, transactional user interface, it's, it's going way over time. Yeah? It's, it's not, not uh, so much there anymore. So everything on device is, uh, uh, is much more in the foreground. And this has an, yeah, an enormous uh, impact on our application architecture. And then machine learning intelligence is, of course, something which goes into the application architecture. And it's so important uh, these days. 
the extensibility, adaptability I mentioned already. So customers, uh, they do not uh, accept anymore and, and out of a good reason yeah, that their uh, businesses uh, remain stable and unchanged over larger periods of time. They want to be adaptable, they want to be flexible yeah, and the architecture has to support that, of course. And, yeah, and... I mean, if you think about it, all these, like, if you think about the, like, if you're a new customer and you just jump on S for HANA, I mean, that's like simple. I mean, you have no baggage, you know, you have nothing behind you. But, you know, if you're a company that's been around for, you know, 100 years and you've grown up mainframe applications and, and then you did some R2 and then you bought this and you bought that and everything else under the sun. Um, you know, it's it's hard to try to say, hey, I'm going to put it, you know, all on one <laughs> kind of situation. I mean, how, what do you say to those customers that are those great big customers, 100-year-old company? They probably have like maybe five, six versions of SAP running. And, you know, they want to be where they want to be that you know, one instance of S4. Don't you think it's hard for them to like architect the whole idea and get it there? Yeah, but this is also the question for them how to, to continue their journey. Yeah? And, and this probably standardization is, is one thing they really would like to have Yeah, because they mm -hmm. have that many systems, the old ones and new ones. Um, then they probably will ask, what is our cloud strategy? Yeah? Can we even standardize in a way that we can use software as a service? We don't, because then we don't have to take care about the operations anymore. Yeah? We can uh, focus just on the on the functionality which we need and require. And um, and I think that is probably what they would need to ask on the one hand. Yeah? On the other hand, um, I think the SAP product portfolio and also the different um, deployment models of, of SAP S for HANA um, help customers on this kind of journey and, and transformation. Yeah, They could start with upgrading their maybe existing ERP, ECC systems to S4 HANA. Yeah? That could be one step and still be on premise, but standardized being on, on HANA, being on the innovation path. They could also go um, direction with private cloud, which still would offer them quite a lot of um, their on-premise um, control and, and um, flexibility, or they could go one step further and go SAP S4 HANA cloud yeah, and standardize more and consume public cloud software as a service offering. There's so many things. So what we're going to do now is we're going to open it up to the audience. You guys can ask a question and let's see if uh, we can get these in here. All right. So let's see what I'm... Okay. Um, oh, curious. I, I know y'all are curious. Okay. Can we have some details around the architecture and how that differentiates with ECC? Is there a section in the book that talks about this? That's Definitely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I would say that the whole book actually is about that. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I do not even know where to start with this answer. So uh, if, if you take a look at uh, how um, S for HANA was architected and created, then first of all, we see that um, in order to have a product available, which is uh, fitting to the characteristics of the digital era, it has to be model driven. This was our uh, conviction from, from the beginning because you need uh, cloud-based uh, extensibility, which requires modeling. Yeah, you have to uh, be able to uh, to access uh, the business semantics of uh, the system out of the meta model. In S4 HANA, we introduced the so-called virtual data model for that. VDM is uh, the abbreviation, which is based on on core data services. So maybe we will go into details on, on CDS and core data services later on. You can think of this as uh, as SQL views uh, plus business semantics. Yeah, so in, in the end, at runtime, 
it's a SQL on, on HANA level, but we have modeled uh, the whole uh, ERP space yeah, in these uh, CDS and, and EDM based models, which is in the end more than 60,000 uh, entities in ERP, yeah, which is, you can think of, of business objects and their relations, how does the sales order relate to the uh, delivery document and, and things like that. This is in the model. And now we are able to, um, yeah, to, to expose this model to a consumer for extensibility. So, which means you can extend the business process on the business semantics and no longer on maybe if, if you're coming from ECC and, and you know, uh, ERP from, uh, former times. Yeah. Then you will uh, know what uh, table VBAK is, for example. Yeah. Uh, which you need to know in order to extend uh, sales order processing in ERP. Yeah? Uh, in S4HANA, this is no longer required. You can extend uh, a sales order document, yeah? which is the business document, the business semantics, yeah? uh, which is on a completely different level. And without that, uh, software as a service product would not even be possible. So, so this, is, but this, is only, this is only one aspect. Yeah? It's, Oh. Um, here's one. I don't know what this means, but how EA is coming from SAP perspective in org, where we have uh, apps to support the business. EA? Uh, EA, yeah. Could you rephrase Yeah, we're not sure what that one. Right, rewrite that one back in. Okay, guys. Um, here we go. Um, can we get some insight into how in-memory works for core operational processes like QM, PM, MM, PP, et cetera? Yeah, so I think it's, it's a question around our uh, HANA optimizations that, that we have done in S4. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. What from do you want to? to yeah, go that's. In? Yeah, so we have one example in the book. So in the in the logistics and and the, and, and material management. We have, so you have the you have the uh, sixty types of inventory stocks calculated on the from the um, you know as as part of inventory and and in in. Uh, in as a ERP, uh, SAP ERP, this was stored in, in different tables. So they always calculated all these stocks whenever something changed. And uh, this was, big, um, but now with HANA, it's the database is able to calculate this on the fly. So you just have the material documents where material moves from here to there, you know, you're like to the warehouse or, is pro or, or it comes from new material, comes from production and so on. So all these movements, if you add it up, you get the stocks on the fly. And just uh, from the basic facts, these uh, different uh, kind of stocks are calculated on the fly and there's no need to have these tables anymore, which makes the data model much simpler. And also when you update something, you don't have to write all these stocks. So it even gets faster when you write. And that's one example because HANA is able to calculate this on the fly. We got rid of a lot of complexity in the software and also in the data model. Yeah, a lot of about went away because didn't need it at that point. Um, here we go. Tobias mentioned adoption. We know that arguments to help customers to adopt best practices, but can I ask what happens to the architecture when customers adapt against adapting? I guess they don't want to adapt and they're adapting. What happens to the architecture at that point? Adapt against adapting. So, so I understand it in a way that uh, the customer does not want to adapt. So they yeah, probably. Want, they want to use it uh, in a stand, more standardized way, which is also fine. I think in general, I, I would say um, as for HANA, it's not one size fits, fits all. Yeah, so you have the different deployment options that we have uh, talked about. So as for HANA on-prem, private cloud, and, and and the public cloud, 
And uh, customers can, can choose uh, between those. So if you are implementing S4HANA on premise, uh, then you have uh, the most uh, in terms of flexibility. Yeah, you can do everything. In, you, we do not recommend it, but you can even modify uh, the code that um, SAP has delivered. Yeah, so we are not preventing that. So it, it's possible. In the public cloud, this is, of course, not possible. There we go with maximum standardization. Why are we doing that? Because this is our only way of providing the cloud qualities that we need to provide, which means uh, um, cloud upgrades, which are non-disruptive. Yeah? So uh, there, there are no upgrades in the cloud. Yeah, So the, the customer wants to consume the service. We want to uh, provide new innovations and the customer shall never be uh, impacted or disrupted. To disrupt it in any way. This is not possible by uh, when when a customer would modify uh, the, the source code. Yeah. Therefore, there's always a trade-off between uh, flexibility and and standardization. And we um, offer customers uh, a path. We, we call that three-tier uh, extensibility model um, to. Um, yeah, to, to scan and to cluster the custom code, the that, that code or their custom transaction that they have done in, uh, in on-prem in a way that they can uh, assess which parts of those can go in the public cloud and which needs to be rewritten. And actually, uh, many of uh, the, the Z and, and Z trans, uh, transaction can, can actually be deleted or removed because they have been replaced by standard functionality in the meantime. So this is uh, um, an offering that uh, we are providing with this three-tier extensibility model. Here we are also talking about the um, uh, SAP uh, cloud ABAP environment, codename Steampunk, embedded Steampunk. I'm not sure if, if this is known. Um, which is actually a, a sandboxed uh, ABAP environment uh, in our S4HANA public cloud solution. Also in uh, the private cloud, it, it's available, uh, which allows, uh, so to say, to, to have a containerized version of your custom code, which is absolutely stable because from there you can only access um, stable interfaces, separation of concerns, only uh, released APIs are possible to, to be accessed. And this means that if you are in this embedded steampunk environment in the sandbox, the code that customers or partners provide there um, does not impact the cloud lifecycle at all. Yeah. Uh, so it's um, in, in terms of clean uh, core. Yeah. It's uh, what we recommend to our customers. And uh, as mentioned, three tier extensibility means that we offer customers um, to take them with us, us on the journey from uh, tier three to tier two to tier one, tier one being the public cloud uh, key user extensibility, which is uh, the most standardized way uh, that uh, we can offer. And that goes to my next question. If we plan to move to private cloud using RISE with SAP, as a customer, do we still need to understand the complete S4 architecture and have our own experts to support the journey? If so, what areas do we need to focus on? You always need the architecture to enjoy what you bought. No, <laughs> just kidding. Um, so what do you think? <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I, I always like to say uh, that architecture is not a purpose in itself. So it's, it, it, it's only there to provide uh, qualities, characteristics, and, and customer requirements in, in, in the end. So this is, um, so the question, do I need to understand the architecture? Well, um, if you plan to move to private cloud using RISE with SAP, so it's a private cloud. Uh, yeah. As a customer, do you still need to understand the complete S4 architecture? Yeah, I think it, it, this goes back to this three-tier extensibility model. If you are on the lowest extensibility level, <clears throat> so you plan to create something which even um, modifies the SAP uh, core uh, structures in the private cloud, uh, it should not be done at all. Yeah? 
Um, but then uh, you need to understand uh, the, the architecture because you're interfering uh, with this all of that. If you're using this embedded steampunk model, yeah, uh, it, it's less important because then you're building on core stable APIs. Hmm. Interesting. I think okay. another aspect is also from the operations perspective. Yeah, I think there are, um, I think it's not public cloud because you want to have a private offering yeah, that gives you more flexibility as a customer and there are about different levels yeah of, of service yeah i think um you don't care about the database management yes but for example um when do you do an upgrade um then there are service packages regarding security updates regarding testing regarding monitoring yeah so as a, a customer can decide which level he wants to buy or do with his it experts yeah and if the it is in then you probably need to live, learn or need to know a little bit more about the architecture mm -hmm. Here's a good one. Uh, can S4 HANA be stackable? And I'm guessing that has to do with the layers, right? Stackable. Stackable. Means it's like, kind of headquarter and subsidiary scenarios? Or? I'm thinking more of like the, the layers of, when you think, can S4 HANA be stackable? Hmm. Well. Let's okay. find back with more info on that one. Um, okay. Does the book describe the different components needed for each S4 version on prem versus public private cloud? For example, is BTP needed for an on prem version? Yeah, it's, it's definitely part of the book. The answer is uh, BTP is not needed for an on-prem installation, but it's an offering. Yeah? So if uh, you want to extend S4HANA on-premise with public cloud services, BTP is the best choice for it because it's uh, the most integrated cloud platform into the S4HANA space with which is out there. Yeah? And, uh, but but if you're going for uh, S4HANA public cloud, then BTP is integral part of, of the solution because uh, S4HANA is a, um, a distributed uh, cloud solution consisting out of multiple services, and some of them are uh, BTP-based services. Hmm. So, um, question is... So when we're talking about S4 HANA Cloud and we're talking about Rise, is that, how do y'all different, I mean, or is it, I, there's a lot of confusion on what is what on some of that terminology. Mm -hmm. okay. How do you guys think? Is it all S4 HANA to y'all? <laughs> no, well, I would say, um... We have products and services, and we have uh, go-to-market uh, bundles. Yeah, and Rice is a marketing bundle of products, tools, services, and and the likes. Of course, it uh, includes uh, S for Hana cloud. Yeah, uh, either a deployment of choice, yeah, so you can go with private or public, but it includes uh, several other products and and services. In the end, it's it, it's meant as a yeah, a business transformation as a service, uh, I think it's called some, sometimes. So it, it offers mm -hmm. services, products, tools um, to take customers into S4 HANA Cloud. Um, it also bundles BTP, business technology platform, so you can use it uh, out, of, uh, out of the box. So to say. Okay, yeah. so I'm glad you said that because I think all of us SAP people, <laughs> I've been at this for 30 years to, in SAP for 30 years. So, you know, we all talk about like, what is, you know, next terminology word numbers? Like, what are they talking about? You know, but to me, and I'm sure to all of you guys, this is S4 HANA. I mean, this is, you know, it's just a different way of deploying, different bundling, different packaging, but it really is the same product. It's just, yeah. you know. And this time it's not an abbreviation, but it's an attractive offering. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's a good offering and it, it's very important because in, in the architecture and also in the book, we're talking about the principle of one. Yeah? So the principle of one means uh, we 
only have one framework in the architecture for let's say output management yeah you want to print something then you have one one solution for it yeah uh, because in ecc sometimes you find uh, 10 or, or 12 different uh, uh, frameworks for for certain uh, architectural tasks and with rise i think it's the same it's also the principle of one, but it's a go-to-market principle of one. Yeah, there's, there's only one offer, one contract uh, for for everything. Yeah, um, yeah, right. And this is uh, it's hard to sell that. <laughs> if you're yeah, marketing, but, you, you want this drag it yeah, in there. It makes it attractive, of course. For exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's a good one. Um, just to better understand, we already had the reference model in SAP since a long time. How is the business semantic different? How do we manage the large amount of code that is available in our existing landscape? Um, and where do you, maybe this is a different question. We'll stop there. So how do we manage a large amount of code that's available in our existing landscape? Reference model in SAP. I think we all talked about that, didn't we? I mean, that's kind of the thing is, you don't need it. Well, a lot of most of that code. I mean, the one part is this extensibility and the, and the transformation and adoption. I think we talked about it. Yeah, and somehow you have to, yeah, look at the code and the artifacts you have, um, decide how future proof these are, and um, which you want to take over, and which of the deployment models of S four HANA are then the most appropriate one. Yeah, which um, are the next steps for your organization or your company. Where do you see the future of S4 HANA in terms of having it as microservices? Maybe the underlying SAP HANA platform can be broken into microservices? Hmm. None thought that? Also, HANA. Um, we'll put that one on the whiteboard. <laughs> Yeah. I think in general, the, it is clear that a modern cloud architecture is distributed, it's service oriented, it's event driven, and, and the likes. Yeah. Um, and as for HANA, public cloud is exactly that. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's consisting of services. Uh, we are using a business events, uh, making it a, a scalable solution. Um, we have incorporated all uh, cloud. Uh, development principles, including CICD, continuous feature de delivery, and, and, and the likes, and also modular deployment. But uh, there is also a but. Yeah? Um, we see that there are several areas where we can benefit from a, a microservices architecture, like uh, Martin Fowler has described it, uh, based on uh, microservices, which are really fine granular. Um, but in ERP, it's well, what we believe it, it's not always and not in all functional areas uh, the right uh, pattern to go that route yeah? because mm -hmm. um, well, what is ERP? Yeah? ERP is a consistent uh, flow of uh, values and, and, uh, and quantities. Uh, you want to have it uh, transactional uh, consistent. Yeah. yeah. Uh, not so much eventual consistent, uh, which is the yeah, a consequence of the microservices architecture. So you really have to to find uh, the right um, uh, yeah cut of uh, of business domains for your microservice, and, and therefore we are going a little bit more into uh, into yeah larger services not so much into to microservices so so we would not go for a cloud erp uh, consisting out of let's say 5000 or more microservices which in the end would be required for uh, the the pure um, concept of microservices this is not our target architecture because we believe this is not the sweet uh, sweet spot between orchestration complexity and the benefits you actually get out of uh, yeah, I think, um, you know, a lot of people uh, have also been asking about how do you choose between on-prem and private cloud hosting? And, you know, and then, I mean, is there any, 
which way would you guys go if y'all had the choice? I think it's a just a personal choice to me, or how your how your what your you know what your company does. Maybe the products. I would go as for on a public cloud, but um, as this is not the, the question, <laughs> um, I think the main point is um, that you don't have to take care about uh, certain uh, yeah, areas of operations. Yeah, you don't have to care about the database installation, upgrade um, the application servers. You you get the upgrade on demand. Yeah, if if you need it, certainly like testing and certain monitoring is is still at your side. Um, I think that's the, the big advantage from that perspective. You need to answer your, or ask yourself, why do you still want to have it as, as an on-premise system? I think it has to do with the government stuff, some kind of government. You know, you have to have security in some fashion here in the U.S. where that's where it's the on-prem or the private cloud hosting. I think that's where he's talking about, like with the NS2 here in the U.S., yeah, but then I would also suggest we have, I think, these operations chapters in the in the book. Yeah, I think what we have uh, regarding certificates, regarding security in in yeah, in, in the mm -hmm. data centers available and and the certification of the of the products and services, um, more on the website. Yeah, I think the architecture so, doesn't age so much, so the book is quite actual. But some of these certifications yeah. certainly are yearly or so. I think then. Yeah, and to look on the website. And thread on that, uh, sometimes it's not even either or. Yeah, sometimes it's both. Yeah, so uh, many customers are using S4 on-prem or S4 uh, private cloud plus a S4 on a public cloud. So we call that two-tier integration uh, scenarios. Uh, maybe uh, you have a uh, a subsidiary that you want to implement in S4 HANA public cloud and you have a corporate uh, S4 on-prem on system, let's say, then we have integration scenarios uh, between those, which is also a possibility and uh, good for several customers. It's a great way to do carve-outs, buy a company, exactly. put them on the cloud, <laughs> stick them up there. <laughs> so you get ready to do that. And then um, let's see. Well, okay, so we have like four minutes left. Um, how about what was um, what's new? That I love to ask this question. What do you think is the new thing that's happening? The last guy I talked to, we were talking about robots conducting everything. So, what do you think? Where are you guys taking this? Y'all have little bots coming around. I think enterprise resource planning is about resources. Yeah? And I think one big um, topic you mentioned already is, is the sustainability. Yeah? Also, a carbon footprint is about resources, about um, managing that, calculating that, managing the supply chain, looking um, yeah, what's the carbon footprint of your supply chain. I think that is um, where we're currently investing to yeah, broaden the product portfolio, making this an uh, integral part also of, of the ERP, yeah? of, of S4HANA, that you can... Uh, manage that and I think that is a yeah very big and important contribution also to to fight climate change from that perspective I think that is yeah one thing where so, our current um yeah society um uh, requirements met meet software I think yeah. here's my question so you know like everybody's talking about like video game like you're an avatar because no one's in the office anymore you know you're an avatar could you like could you guys write that so that I could like get into the system and walk around and then go to accounting and do my thing, and then walk around in the building and go somewhere else and then interact with someone. Is that ever possible? Could y'all architect something like that? I mean, y'all have a lot of code, but, you know. A, a Wolfram did this almost, right? I think he's the master of the diagrams. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but, so you want to really enter a virtual... Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, I think we would rather not develop that on our own, but we would then... <laughs> Metaverse and integration or something which or oh, so it won't come yeah. out of you guys. Huh? Mm. Well, we, we provide the interfaces and, and provide the interface for it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, but I think the visualization is really important. Yeah, as a visualization of architecture, and I think uh, as Wolfram, yeah, I said is, is the master of the diagrams, and I think we did quite a lot. Do you know how many? I think it was as we more than more than one hundred fifty architecture diagrams are in that. Uh, Oh yeah, in this book and is amazing. Book. And, yes. and this makes makes uh, 
things visible and you can point at it in discussion. You can say this, yeah, this box, it talks to that one. And and having something to point at is is really good in the in the discussion and, and for yeah, for getting a yeah, like a mental map that even down to printing you how things work together. You guys broke it down to printing. How does it work? I mean, I, yeah, but printing, is, printing is very important for, for many uh, customers. It's it's mission critical. If you think of a, a company running warehouses and you cannot yes, print, labels, not not good. And that it, and uh, printing output management, by the way, is a process which is completely different in uh, public cloud compared to on-prem. Uh, which also shows uh, that we have uh, several yeah, aspects yeah. where these processes are completely different. Yes. So, yes, definitely. This is a lot of info in here that you guys, I wish I had more time with y'all, but um, everybody can buy the book and don't forget, book club 15 15% off on you guys woo, woo, so that everybody can get the book and read more about this woo, read more about the book and um and hopefully and also the video is going to be on the youtube um channel as well under sap press so that if you, you want to watch it again or uh come up with some ideas and uh Thank everybody so much for coming. Thank you guys. Y'all were great. So what time is it in Germany right now? 6 p.m. 6 p.m. It's early. So y'all go out and have fun. Uh, it's 12 o'clock here. So we're going to lunch. Y'all go to dinner. And uh, cheers to everybody. And thank you guys. And thanks everybody for coming. And we'll do it again. Bye. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.